Good afternoon and welcome to When Sick Leave Runs Out, Managing Employee Absences and Balancing Legal Obligations. I am Nicole Atala um, and Matt Feinberg will be with you in just a second. We're going to tell you a little bit more about ourselves, but first I want to tell you a little bit about Clara Mazza. We are a business law firm. We primarily serve um, government contractors. We also serve commercial businesses across the United States. We have a number of different practice areas that are listed here. Um, I am, again, Nicola Tala. I am the practice chair of our labor and employment group here at Playa Ramaza. We deal with a wide range of labor and employment matters. And um, the reason we are talking about sick leave today is because I am getting a lot of these questions and we expect and have already seen anecdotal evidence of an influx of claims relating to COVID-19 and leave. And I expect going into the fall, we are going to have a, a number of additional issues as sick leave options and leave options generally run out. Matt, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Feinberg. I work with Nicole Plera Mazza, and I am the practice group chair for our litigation and dispute resolution practice group. Um, like Nicole, we've seen uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence recently about claims under the ADA and the um, Family Medical Leave Act, either for leave or requests for accommodation or ultimately litigation um, arising out of those claims. So I, it would be a good opportunity for me to jump on and give you some of our anecdotal feedback and talk to you about some of the risks in uh, denying leave or for terminating an employee in the event that they run out of leave and are unable to perform the, the requirements of their job. So um, just to, really quickly, we have an opportunity to, for, to answer questions. So if you have any questions that come up during the terms or during the time of this um, webinar, feel free to send us a question we'll be monitoring and hopefully we'll be able to get to all the answers. Absolutely, we love questions. They make um, webinars more palatable for all of us. Um, so please, please, please ask questions if you have them. So what are we really going to cover today? Um, the, well, the meat of the, the presentation today is going to be talking about a baseline. What are the various types of leave? When I'm thinking and advising clients in this area, I, I like to know, you know, what's the menu of leave that was available? And that will help us identify all of the legal issues that relate to approving, denying leave, or you know, sometimes, unfortunately, having to terminate for excessive absenteeism. And then we wanted to talk about what the options are when employees exceed their leave balances. You know, what, what's your risk proposition? And I will preface uh, the hour by saying that this is not an easy topic. It is extremely fact-specific and involves what I call you know, the Bermuda Triangle of leave laws. You know, you've got workers' comp, you've got ADA, you've got the FMLA, um, and those are just the three kind of federal triangles. Layer on top of that, all of your state and federal requirements. And just, you know, the essential element that you all need to be able to perform work in order to be viable businesses, which means that you need your people there to do the work. So how do we achieve that balance? And that's really what we're going to talk about today. If so I what types of leave do really, we normally see? Go for if it, I huh? could just jump in really quickly. Sorry, Nicole. Um, given that this is such a complicated um, topic, some of you may have specific questions that relate to your particular business or your particular employees. This webinar is not intended to give specific legal advice about your specific situation. You should leave that to a specific conversation outside the realms of the webinar with uh, legal counsel, for instance, Nicole. Um, but we are providing this as, as an educational reference for you. It's not intended as legal advice and we're not creating an attorney-client relationship by giving this webinar. So if you have any follow-up questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to either me or Nicole and we'll be happy to get you answers. Absolutely, and um, thanks, Matt. We always have to throw in our, our lawyerly disclaimers in there, So, um, but it's very it is very important because we don't want to uh, give you an indication that we're giving you advice and not really understanding the full factual situation. So very important. Um, 
So what types of leave do we really, what are we really looking at here? Well, first of all, most of you will have some sort of company leave policy, and that might involve company provided sick time, it might include vacation, um, it might include paid time off. You might even have some provisions for unpaid leaves of absences for personal circumstances. Some companies have that, some companies don't. Those leave policies might encompass, drop down to the third bullet, any state or federal requirements for sick leave, right? So your company leave policies to the extent that you are subject to a federal or state sick leave requirement might already encompass those requirements in your leave policy. We also, as of April 1st, have this additional bucket of leave relating to coronavirus, which is encompassed in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And we're gonna talk a little bit broad brush about what that is in a second here. And then in addition to that, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit in the next few slides about ways that federal and state sick leave have been interpreted uh, a little bit differently in light of uh, the pandemic and um, the leave that folks need or want to take in light of their personal circumstances. So you have a lot going on um, and you, you have to, do your best to stay abreast of all of the different avenues to take leave. I thought it might be helpful to make sure most that everybody is on the same page when it comes to what I call FICRA or the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So when I when I talk about FICRA, I'm talking about you know the Families First Coronavirus Response Act leave, and this really applies to employers that have under 500 employees. So it did not apply to the um, bigger companies. It was the, the first major piece of legislation that passed when the pandemic took hold. And it provides really for two different types of things. The first bucket is sick leave, and it provides 80 hours of leave for employees who fit five different circumstances. I have boiled those down into what I call two buckets. The first bucket is if somebody gets sick themselves or believes they might be sick and is asked to quarantine by a healthcare provider, then they get 100% pay for that 80 hours up to $511 a day plus their healthcare costs, okay? If they're caring for others, either because a family member has an illness, uh, has coronavirus or suspects suspects they have coronavirus, or their school or daycare is closed and they have notice of that closure, then for that 80 hours, they're gonna get two thirds pay up to $200 a day, plus any healthcare costs that's attributable. Um, so that's kind of the first area of sick leave. And there are, you know, there's a lot of Q&A here, there are a lot of details here, but really the important part is to know that the obligation is out there and there is an anti-retaliation provision in this law that says that if somebody requests or suggests they're going to take this leave, they can't be retaliated against. The second piece of that is extended, fa extended family and medical leave, and it amends FMLA. So even for employers that are not typically subject to FMLA, and we'll talk about FMLA kind of towards the end here, even if you're not subject to FMLA, um, if you employ under 500 employees and an employee has worked for you for 30 days, they may be able to take advantage of this extended family and medical leave. And that would provide an additional 10 weeks of leave on top of the 80 hours if a school or daycare is closed um, as a result of coronavirus or COVID-19. That would again be two thirds pay up to $200 a day plus healthcare, and that anti-retaliation provision also applies to this. This is paid for dollar for dollar through a payroll tax credit. So if employers are expending the money to pay people and to provide this leave, they can apply through Social Security for a dollar for dollar tax credit. Um, and that goes, that is applied for on your quarterly tax filing. Um, so, and it's against any payroll taxes you would owe. So if you owe you know, $5,000 in payroll taxes and you've spent $4,000 on sick leave, you know, your balance is gonna be $1,000 in payroll taxes. 
Um, this leave expires on December 31st, 2020. So this is not a going forward forever thing unless it's extended by Congress. But right now it expires December 31st. You must have provided your employees notice of this leave effective April 1st of this year. And there's a DOL poster on the DOL website that you can circulate to your employees or post online. Um, it does not generally apply. So one of the common questions I get is, you know, we would, we're going to have to furlough people or the government is saying we have to stay closed for a period of time. Can employees take advantage of this leave? And the answer is generally not. However, I will caveat that by saying that there was a New York decision this week in federal court that held that work does not need to be available in certain circumstances in order for employees to take advantage of this leave. And that means that employees could be on furlough and still take advantage of this paid leave provision in certain circumstances. And those circumstances would be if they've self-quarantined, if they're experiencing symptoms, and they're seeking health care. Um, so in those types of circumstances related to COVID, they the work would they could be in furlough. They wouldn't necessarily have to be working. And that, again, that came down two days ago. So this is a very recent court decision. Um, and we're going to kind of stay post, keep an eye out to see if, um, you know, how that kind of plays out. But at this point in time, we do have a court telling us that um, unlike DOL guidance that told us that, you know, if work is not available, you don't get to take advantage of the leave. This court is saying, wait a second, that's not what Congress said in the law. This is how we, are, we should be interpreting it. So if you have policies already regarding FICRA and availability of work has been an issue, you might need to go back and take another look at that. Um, that's one of the hard parts really, right, about COVID-19 and what's happening now is that this is, a const this is new for everybody and it's constantly evolving, which means that we have to be evolving our policies as we go along, and um, which is not always easy to do. The leave can generally be intermittent. Um, you know, the DOL guidance says that if you provide intermittent leave, it has to be at the agreement of the employee and the employer. That New York uh, federal decision that we just talked about a minute ago, that that decision also said, well, it doesn't really make that doesn't really make sense. Um, it's more that the work can be done intermittently and the employee agrees um, to do it. So, it, you know, they, they kind of take issue with the intermittent piece of it a little bit and we're waiting to see how that plays out. But the point I think that's important is that you understand that and that's an option. You know, if somebody is generally can telework, but they're also taking care of kids and so they can work six hours instead of eight, you can provide that flex, that flex time and have them start drawing down on that, um, that leave availability. This is in addition to employer provided leave, which is different than a lot of state sick leave laws, right? Which um, you can kind of, they can run concurrently. The FICRA leave runs on top of what employers provide. Um, and you can't require employees to take employer paid leave first. Um, and some would argue that, you know, why would you if you get paid dollar for dollar through the payroll tax credit anyway? I also wanted to take a, a minute um, to discuss the sick leave expansions. There have been a lot of them. Um, so it's really, really critical that before you make any decisions relating to leave, discipline relating to leave, um, granting or denying leave, that you're checking state and local law. So because the federal government has not taken additional action and frankly, in, with FICRA, we just talked about, limited the availability of that leave to employers with under 500 employees. Lots of states and localities took issue with that. They wanted the big guys to have to provide leave as well. They wanted to make it clear that their state sick leave laws um, also covered all of these reasons that people might need to take sick leave now, You know, not only because they themselves are sick, but because they suspect they might be sick they suspect they've been exposed. You know, typically these state sick leave laws might not have uh, provided protections for these employees to self-quarantine or to take sick leave for self-quarantine in those situations. So, you know, there are these 
the, the states that I've listed here, I'm going to go through them in a minute, are just examples. There are many, many states that have passed sick leave expansion um, acts or clarifications to the application of their state sick leave laws in order to cover these reasons. I mean, the point is they want to keep people who might be sick out of the workplace, right? So a couple of examples, New York has a very aggressive um, COVID sick leave law. It provides additional sick leave, and that's additional to FICRA even. The amount of sick leave that each employee could receive in addition to FICRA and company policy is, sub is subject to the number of employees that the employer has. So if you have folks in New York, it's really critical that you go and you check that law. It also expands to state isolation orders, which is different than FICRA. So FICRA did not protect people or did not give them leave when states and localities shut down. You know, it's kind of like this, there's no work available because I wasn't able to operate. That whole, that whole notion of work being available, right? The New York law says, no, 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 this, you can apply this leave if a state isolation order comes down. Oakland and San Jose, California, are examples of localities that have passed sick leave provisions. Um, so I wanted to include some localities. They also provide additional sick leave. However, it's, it can be added to the regular leave an employer gives. So it's in addition to what the employer gives, but it can be offset against other COVID leave, against FICRA. And it applies uh, to employers over 500 employees, which is one of the targets of these local laws in California. And there are a number of them in localities in California that have passed these laws. It also expands the reasons that, that folks can take leave, which is important that you don't just rely on kind of those federal five reasons. Oregon, Vermont, Minnesota are just a couple of examples of states that have clarified their existing sick leave regulations. So in those states, there is either a sick leave um, requirement that employers provide a certain amount of sick leave, or there is guidance out there about how to administer sick leave. And in those cases, um, they've basically clarified that folks can use their sick leave for COVID-related reasons. And they've added the care of others, you know, school shutdowns, things like that. Um, so I can't stress enough how important it is not to forget about state and local law, particularly if you're a multi-jurisdictional employer, you've got folks in different places, you're not necessarily used to checking those local laws. But it's really critical that you do um, and make sure that you're not missing any requirement there or reason for leave that you weren't thinking about. So if actually, I could. I also like to add. Of, of, sorry, it's so difficult to do a webinar when you're not in the same place at the same time. <laughs> uh, but we're doing the best we can, folks. Um, if I could just give an anecdotal um, uh, instance that we encountered about employers paying attention to their local laws. Um, recently, one of our clients was sued under a local ordinance. Um, that they had that allowed them to skip all um, administrative remedies. They didn't have to go to the EEOC and they didn't have to go to a state human rights um, office before filing suit. So this local ordinance gave them the right to bypass all of that, go straight to court. And of course, our client was not particularly happy about that, but the issue was resolved very quickly. But that's just something, one of the possible ramifications that you need to pay attention to. You need to know the remedies that the employee has in the local law as well, because even though we can argue about whether or not that local law really can bypass federal law, um, this specific ordinance allowed it to happen and it wasn't, um, you don't want to be arguing constitutional preemption issues in these types of cases. So that's just some, one more reason to pay attention to those local rules and to make sure that you're familiar with the local rules everywhere where you have employees, particularly if you have people working from home or teleworking, because it may be that even though your office is in, let's say, Virginia, if someone's teleworking from Maryland, you might need to know the, the 
um, local laws that apply to where that person lives um, because you may be liable for, for violations of those laws. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, if you haven't had a labor and employment type claim before, and this is a very broad generalization, but it, it holds true in employment law quite often, that the most generous of all the things applies, right? So courts have generally, it's generally very hard to make preemption arguments. And we do hear this a lot from folks that do work with the federal government, that well you know i'm i'm operating on a federal site so i'm good right well no it's very it's a very complicated analysis federal preemption often doesn't apply and um it's there's this kind of thing out there called federal enclave jurisdiction which is very very difficult to demonstrate in labor and employment matters so we never like to rely on that stuff um because chances are it's going to be the most generous leave program or entitlement that's going to apply so take all the things you have to comply with and take the one that benefits the employee the most and that's what you're going to be obligated to um most generally it's a good rule of thumb and if you ever need to confirm that you know please reach out but that's generally going to be the case i don't like to um you know a lot of times i'll have clients call me and say but nicole they're on short-term or long-term disability so I added paid leave programs in here for two reasons. One, because they come up and we have to figure out how those short-term and long-term insurance policies dovetail with our obligations to continue to provide leave. But also understanding that states have also passed expansions to their disability and paid sick leave programs where there is one in that state. So there are a number of states that have their own specific disability and paid sick leave programs that work a lot like unemployment insurance, like New York, Washington, the District of Columbia. And in those particular cases, states have often expanded those programs to apply to COVID-related um, illnesses and reasons. But what I wanna emphasize here is these benefits generally don't promise that an employer has an obligation to provide that time off. What it does say, though, is that if an employee is eligible for the time, then they can apply for benefits. So I like to think about these paid leave programs, short term disability, long term disability insurance, state paid sick leave programs as the way employees can get compensation for the leave they are otherwise entitled to. But this doesn't necessarily these laws and short term and long term disability insurance don't necessarily entitle somebody to taking a full six to eight weeks of leave, for example. So um, that's going to be important when we talk about the legal considerations and all of this, right? So what really are the legal considerations? Well, we want to, we want to avoid allegations that we have violated the law by denying folks leave that they have applied for and asked for, or not paying for leave where we have an obligation to pay for leave um, or for terminating somebody when we didn't that when it could be perceived that we might be retaliating against somebody and again that's balanced against a number of considerations depending on the law that might be invoked or the legal obligation that might be invoked so there are you know several laws listed here FICRA, which we talked about the americans with disabilities act often comes into play you might have Family and Medical Leave Act issues. You could have workers' compensation issues. If somebody, um, I don't have a specific slide on workers' comp, but the idea here is that if somebody can show that they contracted COVID at work, it's likely going to be reportable. Now, whether workers' compensation will pay ultimately is another question, but it's likely reportable in most states. Um, and then again, I've mentioned those no, no retaliation provisions that are in every single, generally in every single one of these laws. And then there's a lot of creative claims uh, that plaintiff's attorneys are coming up with to try to, um, you know, see what will stick, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, generally speaking, getting the flu at work or something like that wouldn't give a plaintiff's attorney a lot of, lot of you know fodder to work with but this is a different kind of situation this is a global pandemic and there are a lot of allegations out there about whether employers are doing enough or not um so 
you know, they're the kind of jury's out, haha, so to speak, on whether those claims will stick. But I think it's important to understand that because this is something that hasn't happened in a hundred years, um, you know, we don't always know what somebody's going to come up with. We have a reasonable mm -hmm. basis to to know what might stick. Matt, right, do you have anything another, to add there? I thought. Sure. Yeah. This is another instance where you want to be very um, cognizant of the local laws that apply. Um, there are some states that provide for a specific tort called wrongful termination or wrongful employment practice. Um, those are generally considered to be very narrow types of ca uh, cases that apply to very specific situations that aren't addressed by another statute, but it's not universal. And there are some, statute, some states that allow for these sort of anti-retaliation claims, I'm sorry, anti-termination claims um, based on anything that supports that is supported by a public policy. And one, we can ex assume that courts would potentially um, find it to be a violation of public policy if someone was terminated as a result of reporting an illness such as COVID-19. Um, you also wanna, in addition to um, not terminating an employee, you wanna take into consideration whether you're taking any adverse employment action against that employee. For instance, if that person, um, if, if an employee, for instance, this is a bad example because maybe it would be the opposite, but if an employee wants to work from home or work remotely in order to allow for um, any risk of exposure to COVID-19 um, to dissipate before they return to the office and you, you uh, terminate them for not returning to the office, um, that could potentially be a retaliatory um, uh, claim under the ADA, um, potentially under some other statutes that are applicable in various states. So it's not just termination. Um, it could be anything that materially changes the way a person performs their job. So you want to take into the consideration whether or not there's a material change in the in the ad, in the employment action that you're taking against someone, and to make sure that the decision is applied uniformly across employees who are similarly situated. Um, if you have a number of people who make a report um, similar to uh, related to COVID-19, and then you've sort of reached the end of your rope, and everyone's going to be doing it. If you create the, the place and time where you, you're stopping that practice from happening, the, per, the next person who requests may claim that they're being treated disparately because everybody else who is similarly situated to them was given an opportunity that they weren't. That can also give rise to liability or at least a claim under one of these statutes. And I, I, I don't want to go on to another slide without talking about this. Just in case, someone, um, uh, just in case someone, is, what you've done is totally um, protected under the law, what you've done is fully in compliant, doesn't mean that an employee won't file a claim with the EEOC or file a claim with a state um, office of human rights or in those locations where they can do so, file a lawsuit straight away. And you'll be incurring the attorney's fees to defend that suit, even if your current practices are fully compliant with the law. And so you wanna do your best to know what the laws are so that you can maintain full compliance and have a paper trail that, this, that explains why you made certain decisions when you did um, to best protect you from any claim by an employee. Absolutely. We did have a question about um, tribally owned federal contractors and how FICRA might impact those tribally owned federal contractors. Um, and the person who asked the question pointed out that DOL hasn't and the IRS haven't specifically uh, given guidance as to its application. And what I'll say about that, um, and you know, Matt and I, you know, have a full presentation on uh, tribal sovereignty and and waiver, um, and those are very fact specific inquiries. And my my hunch is that additional guidance has not been provided because it's a very complicated and fact specific analysis as to whether a tribally owned entity has waived its right to sovereign immunity. Um, but I think as a rule of thumb, federal contractors have an uphill battle because they are engaged in um, 
in commerce and commerce with the federal government specifically. And often in these situations are found to have waived their sovereignty and are subject to laws like FICRA. So, you know, FICRA doesn't have a specific exemption for tribally owned entities. And, the, and so it's really critical that we look at a number of different factors to see what kind of arguments we have there with respect to waiver and having that law apply. Um, and so we would consider FICRA a law of what we call general applicability. And there's an analysis that we go through to try to determine whether we, what we think your risk proposition is. Um, mm -hmm. On the other side of that, with respect to IRS, um, the question is, well, if we apply, is the IRS going to deny us? And I, I have not heard of anybody at this point in time having challenges with the IRS providing the tax credit under FICRA because they believe that you're tribally owned and not able to take advantage of that benefit. So I don't, I am not particularly concerned, although I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm not particularly concerned that it would impact the ability to get the tax credit there. I don't, I frankly don't think the set system is set up for that level of scrutiny, scrutiny, and I think you'd have a good faith basis to get the tax credit. But I also think that there's some risk in not applying it. But again, it's, it's very fact specific um, and it deals with, you know, how your entity is conducting its business and what rights it might have waived. For example, in the state of Oklahoma, just one example, in the state of Oklahoma, if you do biz any business off of the reservation, you are considered to have waived your tribal sovereignty with respect to you know, laws that would otherwise apply to that state, right? So it has a very broad, uh, it's like the minute you register to do business in Oklahoma, you've waived. So again, it can be very state specific. Um, and so I, I can't give you a definitive answer, but I can tell you, I'm guessing that's why there has been no guidance out of the Department of Labor on that issue. Okay, so let's dive a little bit more specifically into the ADA and the FMLA so that we can then at the end, I know, you know, ever, holding everybody in suspense, but it kind of the idea is that we'll establish this base and then at the end we'll walk through some ways to handle these situations. But um, the ADA is generally going to apply to employers with 15 or more employees. It provides that employers cannot discriminate against those with disabilities and must make a reasonable accommodation for those with disabilities to perform the essential functions of their job. Um, so that does not negate the need for that employee to actually be able to perform the essential functions of their job if there is an accommodation that can be provided that's reasonable and doesn't, uh, doesn't cause an undue burden for the employer, which we'll talk about in a second. But generally speaking, the, the, the obligation here is don't discriminate against somebody with a disability and engage in this interactive process with that person to determine if there is a reasonable accommodation that would enable them to perform the essential functions of their job. So then comes COVID, right? So we know the ADA is out here and here comes COVID. And the question is, is COVID in and of itself a disability? Not necessarily. But there are a number of factors that come into play with respect to COVID that implicate the ADA. One of those is if somebody has an underlying health condition that would subject them or allow them to take advantage of the ADA and its protections. And COVID has the, poses an additional risk to them, right? So that's one scenario. Another scenario might be that somebody is now working in a different location or might need, need di different accommodations because the workplace is changing as a result of COVID and the pan pandemic. So that's kind of another way the ADA comes up. And the third way the ADA comes up is with all of these questions that we might want to ask folks about, you know, are you sick? Have you been tested? Can I take your temperature at work? That's all ADA stuff. So a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, you know, HIPAA, 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 but it really is the Americans with Disability Act that provides that level of confidentiality um, and governs whether you can ask employees about whether they're sick or disabled, what, how you keep records, all of that stuff really falls under the ADA. So what does it mean to have an undue burden as an employer? And we're, cause we're gonna talk about this, you know, in a little bit. Right, an employee says, 
I need a reasonable accommodation to work from home indefinitely because I have this underlying health condition. And you say, I'm not sure if we can accommodate, you know, you working from home indefinitely or taking a leave of absence for a period of time. And what's my standard to determine whether or not the employer can establish an undue burden? Well, it can be significantly significant dis difficulty, excuse me, or expense. Um, you're also taking into account the nature and the cost of accommodating, what kind of resources might be available to you, and how you generally operated your business. And so we'll talk about in a second, one of the key factors here is um, not only do we have to take into account the cost to us and how difficult it might be to accommodate somebody, but how have we acted in the past, right? So if we've been able, if somebody has been able to successfully telework, for three or four months. And now we're saying we want everybody back on site. Everything's opening up. We want back everyone back on site. And they say, well, we I want to keep teleworking because I have this underlying health condition and I want a reasonable accommodation. It is going to be difficult without another reason to show why it might be an undue burden for that person to continue to work at home for a period of time. Now you may have those reasons, right? Um, but it's something that we can't ignore if someone has been able to successfully telework at home. Um, it's something that we need to really look at and figure out what's our, you know, what is our undue burden here? Um, does somebody, would somebody be eligible for an accommodation under the ADA? And, and what can we do to accommodate them? The other issue is that we don't always have to provide the accommodation that somebody requests, but we do have to engage in that interactive process. So it might be that somebody's terrified to come back to work because they sit in a cube with four people and you say, well, I can't let you work from home anymore, that I have this office that's right by the front door that's on its own, you know, we can accommodate you and put you there. That might be something in the middle, right? So our goal is that we really have to engage in that process before we say, I'm sorry, we're going to have to terminate you because, you know, you have this underlying health condition that doesn't allow you to come back to work. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a hoop you have to jump through, but it's a really necessary hoop, even if you really have a, a hunch that you're not going to be able to accommodate. Like Matt referred to earlier, it's critical that we document along the way so that if it becomes a claim, we can show how we determined that this was an undue burden, that request was an undue burden. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit um, about inquiries regarding disability because this is really coming up a lot when it comes to um, asking employees about COVID related symptoms. So the normal rule of thumb is that you cannot make an inquiry regarding a disability or an illness unless it's job related and consistent with business necessity. And you have reasonable, basically reasonable and objective evidence that somebody may not be able to perform their job because they're impaired by some medical condition, or that employee is going to pose a direct threat due to a medical condition. And that reasonable belief can't be, you know, I heard through the grapevine. It has to be objective evidence um, based on what might be reasonably available to the employer. So it can't be rumor or conjecture. You might have been observing difficulty. You might be observing symptoms. And any inquiry must be kept confidential. So I think what's important here is that the EEOC has already said that COVID can pose that direct threat, that COVID meets that standard because of the pandemic, right? So then the question is, if I see somebody experiencing symptoms, yes, you can ask them about those symptoms. Yes, you can send them home if you think they have symptoms. You can take somebody's temperature, but you know, you have to be very careful about what you do with that information. And that information, if there's paper forms, they must be kept in that separate, separate employee file. And you can't just tell people, you know, I think Joe has symptoms. You have to keep the information as confidential as possible. Now, you may have to let people know on the fourth floor that somebody on the fourth floor, you know, may have COVID and is getting tested, and this is what you're going to do. Um, and that's why it's really critical that if you don't have a return to work plan as to how you're gonna deal with these situations, that you make sure that you work on getting that plan in place because that will really provide a good guidepost 
for you to decide, you know, what do I do when somebody has symptoms? Who can I tell? Who can I not tell? Do I have to tell them everything about this person? Or can I just say there was a person on the fourth floor, you know, that is being tested and this is how we're handling the situation. Advance a slide. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about an example um, that I thought was helpful. And this, I did get this off of the EEOC website um, because I thought it was an interesting way to think about how this could come up. But essentially, um, if, if somebody, let's just say an accountant has low vision and has a screen reader and her office computer as a reasonable accommodation. So we know this person is already subject to the ADA, already has her accommodation, but because of the pandemic, the employer issues notebook computers to everybody and says, okay, take these home. Um, then in accordance with the ADA, the employer provides the accountant with a notebook that also has a screen reader installed. So if you just sent that person home with a, with a notebook, but didn't account for the fact that they still need that accommodation, they might be impaired from doing their job. So it's something you have to take into account as we continue in the pandemic. What's the impact on folks at home? I mean, I've heard from people that they it happened so fast that they're at home, you know, still with chairs that maybe aren't are hurting their backs that could cause comp issues, things like that. So you need to be aware that even if we're not in a physical office, this still this stuff still applies. Another um, example might be an employee that was has been able to telework when the office was closed. Now the office is reopened. She's requesting a reasonable accommodation for continued telework. The employer has to telework determine whether that telework is reasonable. Um, and some some issues, you know, particularly if you're a federal contractor, there are there's a government client at the end of this too that is saying I want everybody back on site or not. Um, and some agencies have been better than other agencies at providing guidance to contractors and frankly anyone going on that site as to whether um, as to what the rules of the road will be, right? Who has to be back on site, when somebody can request a reasonable accommodation, how that process will work with the government. Um, but I will say that from time to time the government has been asking for a lot of information and information that could violate the ADA because they're asking for too much information on an employee. And without that employee's release, we, you know, you can't just assume because it's a government client that you can give all of the medical information about a particular employee to the government. Um, and it's a very, as all things are when it comes to employment and having a federal government client, it can be a little bit complicated as to how you maneuver that. Um, but certainly just, I think my piece of advice to you would be not to assume that the government can or, or the agency can get all of this information and that you won't have any legal liability if you turn it over. Because the reality is that sometimes we have to push back and figure out how to make sure we can comply with the ADA and still give the government what it needs in order to feel good about folks being on site. Um, if so I could jump the in real question. quick. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. So in addition to discrimination, uh, a ban against discrimination and an obligation to provide reasonable accommodations, the ADA also has an anti-interference clause. And what that means is that um, the employer can't encourage or uh, force um, a person who has a, reason, a known reasonable accommodation, something that has been provided to them previously for a known or perceived disability, from giving up that accommodation. So, for instance, uh, an individual might have um, the opportunity to work from home because they have an autoimmune disorder, but that person previous to COVID didn't use that accommodation unless they absolutely needed to. Maybe they did it once a month or, or, or once every three months, but they still had that accommodation. Assuming now that that person wants to take the, the reasonable accommodation and work and telework on a permanent basis or on a long-term basis, it would also violate the ADA for the employer to um, encourage that individual to give up 
their accommodation or to modify their accommodation to reduce the number of out of office hours or out of office days they have. So that's another thing to um, keep your eye on. It, it doesn't come up nearly as much in the ADA context pre-COVID, but we have seen an increase in ADA interference claims coming out um, probably in the last three to four months. And so that's just another thing that you want to keep your eye on. Um, making sure that if someone does have an accommodation that you're meeting that accommodation, even if it was something that existed prior to COVID becoming a major concern. Yeah, and I'm getting some good questions, guys. So give me just a minute and then we're going to go back and talk about some of the questions because um, I do think there's some good questions there. So I wanted to just very quickly talk about the ways that COVID is kind of coming up in the hiring process. And, and questions that you, you know, can ask and how you would deal with them. So a question I often get is, can I screen employees for COVID? Yes, you can. New hires and folks that are already employed. If it's a new hire, though, it has to be after the offer. So you need somebody to start tomorrow. They've just applied. You want to kind of handle all the applicant screening stuff before the offer that's not a good idea all of the applicant screening stuff has to happen after you make that offer can you take temperatures same deal yes but after the offer that's considered a, a screening so normally you know pre-covid we said don't take folks temperatures you know don't take employee temperatures but the eeoc has said in light of the pandemic we can't do that you should keep in mind though that having a fever or not having a fever is not necessarily um, dispositive of that, whether somebody has it, right? A lot of people don't run fevers. It's one indicator that could be present, but yes, you could after the offer. What if somebody it needs is supposed to start on Monday, but they call you and they have symptoms? You know, how do you handle their start date? Well, you could certainly delay the start date. Um, you'd want to be careful about making a decision to retract the offer. Um, because at that point in time, um, they might not be eligible for COVID leave under FICRA because they hadn't been employed at all yet, but they might have some other protect protections. Um, for example, under it could if they're really sick, it might implicate the ADA. Um, so you want to be careful about that. But in some circumstances, you you know likely could revoke an offer. You just want to be very careful and probably consult counsel in those situations. What about withdrawing an off offer? I think we kind of just covered this one, but um, you know, you need the person to start, but they have COVID symptoms. I mean, again, that's that that's the issue I basically just talked about, which is be careful about it. Um, generally speaking, you might be able to do it. You just want to make sure that um, you don't have any ADA type issues there um, when you do it. What about questions during employment? So some of them are similar. You can screen people, you can take their temperatures, you can request a doctor's note, but you should also check your state and federal sick leave laws if you're subject to them. For example, federal contractors that are subject to sick leave for government contractors, you can't get a doctor's note unless somebody's been gone three days or more that says they need to take it. Um, the, the FICRA requirements, if, uh, if they get FICRA leave, just say you have to have an indication, you have to certify that you're seeking um, treatment from a healthcare provider. You don't necessarily have to provide a doctor's note under FICRA. So, but generally speaking, you could request a doctor's note. You just wanna make sure that, again, you're checking those state and local laws. What if somebody does, can't return to work um, and they had COVID um, or they're scared to return to work they have somebody who's at risk in their household and they don't want to return to work. And I think this is a good time to talk about one of the questions that came in, which is what, what happens if somebody wants an indefinite leave of absence as an accommodation for a disability? Um, and telework is not an option for them. So what do we do in those cases? The, the ADA does not provide for indefinite leaves of absence unless you have provided indefinite leaves of absence to other people that maybe you weren't disabled in the past, right? So what we're really looking at is, as far as the duration goes is um, what have you provided in the past to somebody who was similarly situated, who worked in that job in that capacity under similar circumstances 
and would it, you know, what length of time would be reasonable? But if you receive a doctor's note that says, you know, hey, I don't know when this person's going to be able to come back because, frankly, I'm not going to clear them to come back until we have a vaccine. The law doesn't necessarily protect that person, and that person may well lose their job. But again, you need to look at the circumstances in the past. If that person goes out and makes a claim under the Americans with Disabilities Act, they're going to say, you treated me differently than you treated people that you know, didn't have this issue going on. And I know of certain situations, you know, Mary Jane went on a sabbatical last year and she was in my same position and you let her go for a year. And yet, you know, we reasonably think we'll have, you know, uh, hopefully all will be back to work within a year. So why can't I have the year off? And then you'll give me my job back. Well, the law doesn't necessarily protect for that, but you'll want to check to make sure like, what have we done for other people in the past? Um, how do we want to handle these things? But generally speaking, unlimited leave is not a reasonable accommodation for a disability. That does not excuse you from engaging in that interactive process. So somebody might say, I don't want to come back to work. And you could say, well, what's the concern? Again, let's, let's take that example from earlier. I work in a queue with four people. It's not safe for me to be working next to them the time I have this underlying health condition um, and you say okay well we won't put you back in those queue but maybe there's another place that we can put you that feel, that is safer for you uh, that isolates you a little bit more. maybe there's something else we can do there right so it doesn't get you off the hook to engage in that reasonable accommodation um, interactive process but you also don't if if they say you know I had a situation a few weeks ago where the company bent over backwards to provide alternate solutions and the person just was not going to come back on site and as such was in terminate their employment was terminated so that does happen from time to time and, and you don't have to provide that um, accommodation forever you got to get your work done right okay um the next question i have is what if somebody says I was around somebody who tested positive. I want to go get tested. I don't want to go back to work until I get my test back. Well, that can involve a couple of a couple of issues. The first issue is if they believe they need to go get and they're seeking attention, medical attention from a healthcare provider, and the employer is subject to FICRA leave, that could be a qualifying reason to take that protected FICRA leave, right? So, you know, the first thing I would say is if they're seeking medical attention at, from a healthcare a, a provider, aka the test, right? In other words, the test, then they may very well qualify for that leave. Now, testing is taking right now, you know, some, I've, I've heard instances of five weeks for testing to come back. The testing isn't necessarily what needs needs to be done, they might just need to quarantine. They might need to get a healthcare provider to tell them to quarantine for the CDC guidance right now is 10 days. But um, a lot of physicians are saying, see if you exhibit symptoms in five to seven. If you don't ex exhibit symptoms, you're, you can go back to work. So again, that you might need to handle that through other means other than the testing and say, we want a doctor's note to say how long you need to quarantine. And then we'll assess it under all of these different provisions, right? We'll assess whether it's eligible for FICRA leave, whether you're protected because of the FICRA leave, whether it falls under some sort of ADA issue or not. Um, you know, one of the more common ones we're getting right now is, um, you know, I was out because the office shut down. Somebody tested positive in the office. So that first, everybody was out for a week or two there. Then I would I decided to go on vacation and I traveled to, um, you know, Texas, which is a high, uh, a designated a high um, impact area right now. And so then I isolate. I took that vacation for a week and then I isolated for two weeks when I got back. And now we're looking at the school year and I want to take an additional ten weeks of leave, right? So these are the types of situations that we're seeing on a daily basis from clients. They're like. They've basically taken, they have not been here the whole summer. I need somebody to do this job. Well, it may be 
that certain pieces of it were protected and now they have to return for three weeks and then are again protected for an additional 10 weeks under FICRA because they need to care for a child whose school isn't opening. All of that leave might be protected, but at the end of that protected leave, they're kind of out of options, right? And a lot of parents have already eaten through a substantial part of their leave or all of that leave because they needed to use that leave in, in March, April, and May of this year or over the summer. Um, so I think you're going to see more instances of this, you know, I can't come back to work and, and then we have to decide what we're gonna do with folks at that point. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, very quickly, because we're almost at a time, you have the Family Medical Leave Act. I just wanna mention that if it applies to folks, if, there, if you have 50 employees within 75 files, you have to provide 12 weeks of leave a year. What's really important is that this is for serious health conditions. Somebody might get COVID and then and that would likely qualify under the FMLA as um, protected leave, but this is generally not paid leave. Um, it also has a weird interaction with FICRA, which is if somebody takes their FICRA leave for family, for kids being out of work, of school or daycare, they don't get 10 weeks and then another 12 weeks for FMLA. It's 12 weeks total in a year. So if they've taken that FICRA leave, they've run they, you know, they're running pretty darn close to the end of what's allowed under the FMLA. I feel like. Um, employer required absences are just part of the deal right now, right? Employers shut down to quarantine, employers furlough folks for lack of work. Um, those might have different implications under FICRA, as we talked about on an earlier side, it may affect, but it may affect the accessibility to paid leave under circumstance, certain circumstances. What's really important is that you establish a policy relating to the use and payment of your leave. So what I can't stress enough is don't, we know these things are going to happen. We know they are coming up. So think about the scenarios that we've talked about today. Are we going to pay people if we shut down for a period of time because somebody has COVID? And is that going to have to come out of an employee leave bank? And if it does and somebody runs out of leave, are we going to let them run into the negative to a certain amount or are we going to say sorry you know you're out of leave so it's real and then it's really important on top of that that if you have salaried employees you look at whether deductions such deductions would be permissible under the fair labor standards act so you know most of these types of things like shutting down or when somebody travels voluntarily i get asked a lot of questions about you know employer travel, uh, employer travel, or like you were requiring somebody to travel for work and then they're traveling to one of these hotspot areas, what do we do when they come back? Are we gonna pay them if they can't telework? What about employees that choose to travel out of state? And then there are quarantine requirements when they come back. Again, what's really critical here is that um, you understand that you can implement policies regarding employee travel. And if somebody decides to travel to a hotspot, they need to tell you, and then they have to quarantine and that's on their own on their own dime. Um, but it's important that when we implement these policies, we do so taking into, into consideration that there might be states that provide FICRA leave that they might qualify for. We expect school closures to continue um, on and off throughout the school year. So, you know, what are you going to do as a company to accommodate parents if you can? Um, there's that extra 10 weeks if they're, if FICRA is available or if there's a state law equivalent that's available, but chances are that's gonna run out. And there's no legal requirement to maintain employment outside of perhaps a state law or some development in another um, stimulus package. A lot of folks are concerned about suspected abuse of leave or excessive leave. Um, and so I've listed kind of some questions to go through as you're thinking about these. Have you gone through the request process? Like has this person gone through the appropriate request process? Does that leave fall into a protected category? You know, is it fair labor? Is it a Family Medical Leave Act issue? Is it a FICRA issue? Is there a state law issue there? So check those boxes. Can the person produce the appropriate documentation? So does it seem like it's abusive or not? What is your policy and your return to work? Uh, what is your return to work plan or policy say? You know, what has the company decided it will do? 
And then how have you treated other people that are similarly situated? So it's not a one size fits all, but I think these are a good set of questions to think about. Um, and then if the answer is that none of this stuff applies, you're probably, you know, okay to proceed with some sort of um, disciplinary action. Um, make sure that you have a good complaint process. We always like to see complaints go to employers before they go to the EEOC or the Department of Labor. Um, and so make sure employees know how to report concerns. This is new ground for everybody. Everybody's going to screw it up somewhere. Um, they're going to make bad decisions or incorrect assumptions. So it's really critical that you have a good complaint policy. Any FICRA complaints could go to the Department of Labor. So that's where you're going to be watching for those FICRA type complaints or Fair Labor Standards Act violations. All of the ADA, FMLA stuff um, is going to go to the EEOC or some state equivalent office. And for federal contractors, there's also the Fed Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs and ADA, um, the ADA equivalent for federal contractors can go there. And as Matt mentioned earlier, sometimes you just get a good old fashioned lawsuit, which is unfortunate. So I know we're over time. Um, I know this is a very difficult subject, so I really appreciate um, your feedback. Um, I did receive one quick question that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make people mad. Um, but the question was, and Matt, uh, you might be able to chime in on this too. But the question was, there's this New York case out regarding FICRA. If we're in like Alaska, how much attention should we even be paying to this New York case? But it's really a New York federal case, so I think everybody's watching it, right, from a jurisdictional perspective. Right. Right. So right. generally speaking, the Southern District of New York, which is where this case came from, that's the federal court that governs New York City. Um, it's not technically binding on anybody. Um, a trial court decision is not binding on other trial court decisions, even in the Southern District of New York. So ultimately, you're going to have to do your own risk benefit analysis to determine whether or not you believe that your local court, whether it be a federal court in your in your state or a local court, um, is going to apply that decision. I can say this, the Southern District of New York is one of the most influential courts in the country. Um, many states, particularly along the East Coast and the West Coast, will look to the Southern District of New York and ultimately to the Second Circuit, which is the federal appeals court that governs uh, New York and that area of the country as uh, having very influential decisions, people, judges who think very critically of the law and um, provide um, solid legal analysis. So if you are a risk averse company, your best bet is to comply with the FICRA decision from the Southern District of New York. If you are less concerned about that, if typically you, um, you haven't experienced complaints from employees, if generally you're in a state where um, there is less concern over COVID-19 than in some of the hot spots like Florida or Texas or New York, then you have a little more flexibility. I generally, in employment cases, Nicole touched on this a little bit earlier, generally speaking, um, courts often apply the broadest um, application of, of employment laws, particularly federal employment laws. And so I would generally... Um, advise that you comply with the New York ruling, no matter what state you're in. Um, but again, there's that's no guarantee that a federal court in your jurisdiction or a state court in your jurisdiction would side with the Southern District of New York on these issues. And for the most part, and this will be my kind of last comment on this, for the most part, what the New York, the Southern District of New York did, I don't think is particularly bad for employers. Um, it does give some avenues for employees to get leave, for example, when they've been otherwise furloughed, but to the extent the employer is gonna get 100% of that cash back, um, you know, I don't necessarily, I didn't, I didn't see it as necessarily anti-employer, it is definitely pro-employee, um, but, you know, um, I think in general it, it didn't, bother me a whole heck of a lot, except it might cause you some problems going backwards. If people kind of show up and say, I should have been able to get paid for that two weeks. 
So um, I know we're over time and I appreciate everybody spending the hour with us. I know there aren't any silver bullets here, but I hope um, understanding how some of these things fit together was helpful for you. Please reach out to Matt or I if you have any questions or concerns. Um, again, there's our legal disclaimer, you know, at the bottom here, our contact information is here. Um, thank you for taking us away from our email for an hour and we hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.